Welcome to Victoria Rumble Room, a show that attempts to bring the major issues to the forefront from Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada, and the world. And uh, I'm Robin Adair. Usually we're having a, a happy time at the beginning of this show. Uh, it's, a, it's a light show in some respects, despite the rumble tag, but uh, not this time. This is a serious program. There's a serious issue going on right now in the Ukraine. My co-host with the most, John Jurisic, is, is with us. And John, you have a Balkan background that comes from your family. You're well aware of what Russia and Soviet countries are capable of and how they can rack and ruin a place. You must be feeling a lot of empathy right now with the Ukraine. Uh I am of a Croatian descent, although a naturalized Canadian, but I've heard a lot of stories and been back to many years ago, what was Yugoslavia, uh, then there were wars that created six to eight separate countries, and all of that stemmed from a communist takeover and a communist um, ruling from Moscow, and uh, those were brutal times. I don't think we entirely understand what dictatorship means, um, what autocracy means here in Canada and North America until you live in Eastern Europe. And I think we're now beginning to see what that means. How, you know, they're actually killing each other. They're running over each other. Am I upset? Um, absolutely. But the, the, the two feelings I, I feel most are one of surprise. I, I Despite all of the, you know, um, writing on the wall, I, I'm still surprised that this happened. And frustration, a, a sort of powerlessness around what we can do about this from Canada. However, over time, now over the past several months, we've had a real chance to talk about these sorts of things with a military expert, that being Dr. Chris Kilford from World Roads. He was once a senior military attache in Turkey and other countries that border Russia. And here's what he had to say about this extraordinary cynical move, deadly move by Vladimir Putin. And now joining us in the Victoria Rumble Room, once again, is Royal Roads Professor, Dr. Chris Kilford. And uh, great to have you back on the program, terrible circumstances, but uh, great to have you here to talk a little bit about what's going on in Ukraine. Well, thanks for having me back. And I, I kind of figured we would be back. It was just a question of whether it would have been this week or the following week. But uh, but here we are. Now, when we last talked to you, you talked about a feeling that maybe there was a chance that they would not actually invade, that Russia was posturing. This was optics for home. There was a, a lot of reasons Putin would have not to go into Ukraine, uh, mm -hmm. that the Ukrainian Forces are fairly large, certainly relative to some forces that he might go barraging against and that this might be a real risk for him. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet here they are. They've invaded. They're, they're on their way to Kiev. And it looks like it's, uh, it's full on. Are you surprised at what's happened? Yeah, I think I said at the time that whatever might happen, it would be a lose, lose. Yes, for the people of Ukraine, but certainly for Putin, no matter what he decided to do. Um, I think it always comes as a shock to people when someone does decide to do this because, uh, you know, look, we live in democracies, we try to get along, uh, we don't expect this sort of behavior, we don't condone it. It's something that happened before. It, it was uh, 1956 in Hungary, 1968 in, in then Czechoslovakia. Uh, Georgia was a smaller scale, uh, uh, on a smaller scale. Um, it, it, but regardless, we never, we never, ex we never want this to happen. Uh, we, in our minds, try to think out how it, you know, how can we not have it happen? So you saw all of that um, shuttle diplomacy taking place, and then it does happen, and it just shows you uh, how evil the world can be. Uh, at times, and I know in Canada, we have this tendency to think that everything is fine out there and that we can delay purchases of defense equipment and not, not, not worry about it. But it shows you it's a wake up call. And, um, you know, I suppose uh, we should have uh, heeded what the U.S. had to say. Uh, I recall uh, saying on the program that I thought the U.S. in many respects was 
uh, goading the Russians, you know, saying, come on, if you're going to do it, you may as well do it. And I still believe what I said before, that there are some folks in Washington who are now, uh, I believe, relishing, and perhaps rightly so, the opportunity to, uh, at some point, show Putin the door. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of unknowns right now. We don't know how long Ukraine will be able to put up a fight. Uh, we suspect that they'll be overcome eventually. We don't know if the country will be divided. There are a ton of, of unknowns, but we sure know some things. We know that whatever the outcome, that Putin has damaged himself and his country, not just in the short and medium term, but I would say in the long term. We know that for certain. We know that NATO as, a, as an organization has uh, galvanized around this issue and that other countries are looking at joining NATO. So we know certain things. The fact, though, um, is that the Ukrainian people will, will be the ones that ultimately suffer. And to a lesser extent, the Russian people, they'll suffer too. They'll suffer out of all of this. You know, Chris, that's a real great segue for my question. By the way, thanks for coming back. Mixed emotions. <laughs> yeah. You're clearly mm. an expert. We're clearly very lucky to have your opinion. But under these, under under what circumstances, right? Um, right. Last time we chatted with you, mentioned um, one of the reasons that that was put forward that that Putin was going to attack Ukraine was to kind of galvanize support at home. <laughs> that could have been a bunch of misinformation. Nonetheless, mm. lately there have been these huge protests in Moscow. Mm. You know, uh, I, I, I'm surprised about that. Fair to say Russian people seem to be pretty mixed about this war. What have you been hearing? What, what's your sentiment? Yeah, I've seen what's been happening in Russia with the protests in some 50 odd cities. And it, it was uh, actually good to see. And I think this, um, this points to a, you know, a, a particular fact. You know, Russia is in this sort of perilous cycle of, of self-harm. And we have seen the, the GDP in that country, uh, it's, uh, you know, from, from 2013 to 2020, it's, it's fallen by 37%. So folks at home in Russia are struggling. They're suffering. When you get outside of the big cities, it's tough. And when you see your own country now invading another country for the most ridiculous reasons, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people asking themselves, you know, what is this all about? Because it's, really going to impact their long-term future. You know, these, these cheap package tours off to, to Turkey and elsewhere in the region by Russians and being able to move around as freely as they have been, I, I don't see that happening. Mm. Uh, now, the Russian people, you know, bless their hearts, because I certainly wouldn't want to be out on the streets in Moscow trying to uh, stand up for, uh, for Ukraine and, and uh, being part of an anti-war movement because I know I'd be arrested. I mean, it's frightening to be in this situation. But the, at the end of the day, you know, it's the, the Russian people that they've been condoning this man in power for a very long time, since, since 2000. And maybe it was okay in the beginning, but it's not okay now. Mm -hmm. And so you look to the Russian people and you ask yourself, why aren't you doing something? And I know, I know that's so easy to say. In these dictatorships, it's dangerous to do anything. But I think if I was President Biden, as an example, I'd be calling on the Russian people. It's, it's fine for Putin to call on Ukrainians to surrender and give up and all that. But I think if I was President Biden, I'd be saying to the Russian people, you, you need to do something. This isn't right in 2022 or any time. But certainly not now. Uh, we need to see that call. And I, and I think, you know, here's the thing with democracies in the West. We are so slow. We are like turtles. And these dictatorships like Putin, they can be the rabbits and they can get there and do things before we can even think about it. But the fact is, at the end of the day, it's the democracies, slow as they are, that actually end up sorting things out. And we may not like it because it's not happening tomorrow, but, but we will see. We will see slowly but surely that Russia is squeezed tightly and there's no way out for them. And I'm not so sure. I don't, like, I don't believe this is one of these things where we're going to lose interest. Great again to hear from Chris Kilford. We'll be keeping close tabs with him as things continue to unfold in a terrible way in Ukraine. And I would add that this 
is such a large military exercise, a military tragedy. And Vancouver Island is a center of a military community, both active and retired. Victoria is the host of the Navy, Comox, the Air Force. And we have so many people in our lives, friends, family, acquaintances, who are directly tied to the military and to NATO. And NATO is now at high alert. Plans are being made. What happens if NATO has to get more actively involved? And suddenly, friends, family, and acquaintances of ours right here in our home could be directly affected by this. It's very troubling. On top of that, a million and a half Canadians are of Ukrainian descent, including our Deputy Prime Minister, Krista Freeland, who spoke in Ukrainian just recently to Ukrainian Canadians. It all hits too close to home. Our prayers go with the people of the Ukraine. Well said, Robin. Well said. Such a powerless and helpless situation. However, you and I, it's important that our show, our community, our country, that we keep tabs on this and keep trying to understand what's happening over there. We cannot simply stand by and let autocrats, dictators, and thugs like Putin and Russia now push countries around, invade, and oppress. Nonetheless, let's shift to a couple of local items of great interest. First, a judge has ruled the Beacon Hill Trust in fact, does have jurisdiction. It does have jurisdiction in that park and tenting and camping should never have taken place. Surprise or not? Will this stop campers coming this summer? We shall see. How about we ask Janice Williams, a friend of Beacon Hill Park, what she thinks of this ruling. Part of what we saw, and I think most people would say it was fairly clear even before this happened, that that wasn't really a kosher use of Beacon Hill Park. Uh, and I think there's reason to believe that the city very well knew this was off limits, that this wasn't something that they should do and they did it anyways, that there has to be some level of respect that's expected of those sheltering in our parks. Um, if I were to go camping or be a guest anywhere, I would do so with, with a, a level of respect for those around me and screaming at 2 a.m., stealing from the neighbors, leaving a mess. Those are things that cannot be tolerated and should not be tolerated. And so it's one thing to say, we're gonna accept sheltering 7 a.m. to set, or 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Um, but quite another to allow people to abuse that system and set up for weeks on it. Super to hear from Janice Williams, who has a strong perspective on this issue. She's been on the ground. And, uh, you know, there are people who would really like to see Janice Williams run for civic office in Victoria. We'll see if that happens. Uh, John, another major issue. In fact, this would probably be the number one issue right now if we didn't have what was going on in the Ukraine. That is the growing doctor shortage in British Columbia. It's especially serious here on Vancouver Island. 850,000 people in BC don't have a family doctor. It's 100,000 on the South Island. One in four people on the South Island do not have a family physician. And uh, so what, what can be done about this? Where do we turn? We asked retired doctor, Dr. Bill Cavers, what he has to say or contribute to this discussion, and uh, let's zoom him in. And now joining us in the Victoria Rumble Room for the first time in 2022 is retired physician Dr. Bill Cavers. And Bill, it's so fantastic to have you back on the show. It's good to be back, and it's actually good to be thrice retired. Oh, there you <laughs> go. Well, I've been retired for a while, and uh, I can highly recommend it, especially if you have a show. But anyway... Um, <laughs> The talk of the town right now in British Columbia, certainly, is the doctor shortage. I believe we're approaching 800,000 people now in the province of 5 million that don't have a physician. And it's even worse on the South Island. It's one in four. There's 400,000 people, 100,000 don't have a family doctor. And I guess my first question is, uh, 
how did we get to this point? And uh, why don't we have enough family physicians? Well, it's an awful situation. And I appreciate it's very distressing for a, a number of people who are looking for a doctor, need a family doctor and can't get one. It's an awful situation. And it's a bit of a perfect storm. It's not one of those things that you can summarize in 25 words or less. So first of all, of all we need more family doctors per capita now than we've ever needed before. Governments are used to quoting how many physicians per 100,000 population, and it's been going up. But we need a lot more physicians, family physicians, for the same number of people in the population. The population is older. Yeah. They're more complex because we're doing a better job. We are, have more interventions for illnesses and catastrophes. We have better outcomes for chronic ailments. People are living longer. But all these things need supervision, maintenance, referrals, reviewing of lab tests. And it means that a family physician can no longer have the same size of patient population in the practice in a manner that it's handleable. When I was in my younger career, I could have about 2,500 to 3,000 patients in my panel. And these days it's, it can be 1,500, in some areas where the patients are more complex, it can be lower than that. And so you can see that this is going to have a, a ripple effect on how many family physicians we need and how many people can be covered. Also, in when I graduated, family physicians worked longer hours. They worked brutal hours. They worked 60 to 100 hours per week. They, they were notably absent from family uh, occasions. And they had two to four times or five times the risk of divorce, depression, and suicide. That was not sustainable. And these days, it's a different world. Physicians are now female and male instead of the predominantly male population when I was trained. And largely, they're double income families. So there's, they're juggling two careers. And both parents want to be involved in the children's lives. That's healthy. I support it. But it also means with the complexity of the patients and the healthier choices being exercised by physicians, you're going to need more physicians for the same number of people in the population. There are lots of reports that say that family medicine is the cornerstone of the healthcare system. And yet, in my experience, any other avenue of remuneration is better supported than being a community family doctor. <laughs> the fees, the payments to family doctors has not kept up with other choices like becoming a hospitalist, like working shifts in the emergency room, like working sessional works as a GP psychiatrist or GP anesthetist. You take the number of choices being faced by a medical graduate going into family practice with a debt load of $150,000 and a family, it doesn't make a great business sense to go into community medicine. Dr. Bill Cavers, uh, great to have you back on the show. Thank Your you. previous shows were one of our most highest viewed. So clearly what you're saying is of interest. No controversy, however. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bill, I was, I've been involved in labor market consulting now for a better part of 10 years, trying to identify how to deal with the skilled trades gaps, et cetera. Okay. One, of the, one of the more short-term solutions or suggestions is, is one of immigration and, and how do we more quickly bring in skilled trades professionals into Canadian society to help with, with, these, with these gaps in, in skills trades. So uh, what's, what's your opinion on this? Uh, could, could, could there be a, a quicker solution via an immigration route? Foreign doctors. Foreign doctors, yeah. I think so. Some countries overseas have very clear records. They're very compatible with ours. And we know a few of them, you know, Ireland, uh, UK as a, a whole. Uh, Australia, New Zealand. I did my internship in New Zealand and I worked in Northern Australia and I was cross-accredited. So that's, that's kind of a no-brainer. 
but you start getting some other countries and then the documentation may not, the training may not be the same. There may be some deficiencies. There, there may not even be the records. Some of the countries are full of strife and some of the records may not be accessible or the governments may not be willing to release them. So, but you know, Bill, I mean, I, I, I'm familiar with at least two cases where Canadians have gone overseas to train, one in Ireland, one in the UK, and they'd love to come back to Canada to practice medicine. And there are roadblocks, even though they've gone through those systems that you've just said are, are actually comparable to what we have in Canada. Okay, so look, I'm telling you what the college faces. Do I think it can be sped up? Yeah, I do. Mm-hmm. I think there are some things that can, some interventions that can be introduced that would speed up the process and not have some of these physicians held up quite so long. And the other thing that can happen to offset the, the primary care crisis, come on, let's, let's get the teams in. I mean, realistically, previous governments introduced uh, midwives and there was no attempt to integrate them with the current, the, the, at the time, family doctors who were delivering obstetrics. It led to an outflow of family doctors doing obstetrics. Now there are nurse practitioners being trained and I feel there's inadequate attention being paid to integrating nurse practitioners with the existing primary care. Now I'm not suggesting that nurse practitioners have to adapt to the doctors and the doctors don't have to lift a finger. I'm saying there needs to be an integration and there needs to be incentives and programs brought in so that teams become a reality, not just something that I've been talking about since 1995. So, Bill, uh, this is emerging now, this doctor shortage as a medical medical services crisis to some degree, compounded with a pandemic as the number one community issue number one political issue. Um, (laughs) There are folks who say, well, just put more taxes, just just pay more, just pay more, put more money into the system. And there are some that say, well, what about private health care? Why can't we now introduce a system where folks who can pay for it will let them, you know? So what are your thoughts on on this one? So throwing more taxes at it isn't going to do the job. No more than you can walk into a, uh, a Ford or Chevy plant and say, we want you to double the number of cars you put out in the next one week or year. You need to actually have training. There's a bottleneck and a number of physicians who can train the younger physicians so you get a good product coming out. What about private health care? Yes, I think it should be explored. Uh, I think it should be tightly controlled. There is the uh, analogy that if you allow some people to leave the lineup outside the theater, that'll help people in the lineup get in sooner. But that's only the case if the projectionist stays in the theater that you're lined up for. So we need to also control um, the movement of physicians between public and private. So that has to be very carefully, very carefully thought out. And we're seeing all the clinics, the walk-in clinics shutting down right now. We have 100,000 people on the South Island right now who can't get a doctor. The yeah. things you're talking about, Bill, I mean, they, they sound they sound promising in some respects about reordering this, but uh, government never is famous for acting really quickly or decisively. And this is, I would suggest, a real crisis. A lot of us are getting older. I don't want to wait 10 years for them to figure out how to do this. I don't know whether I'll be here in 10 years. So, I mean, for those of us who are getting kind of concerned immediately, do you see any sign that we're going to take immediate action to solve this problem? I really do think it is time for the government, the provincial government, and the healthcare professions to get together and work and have the wherewithal to make some very serious, and I'm going to say potentially difficult decisions, because I do not feel that British Columbians are receiving adequate access to the care they need. It's heartbreaking. I have spent 43 years in medicine. I have spent the last 25 years of my professional career advocating in our professional association and in my committees with government, advocating for enhancing primary care 
and working out ways where the, the profession can work collaboratively with the government. And I think that this is um, humiliating and embarrassing. That's good to hear the thoughts of someone who's dedicated his life to family medicine. Dr. Bill Cavers is one of our most viewed interviews across this nine to 10 months since we've started the Rumble Room. He gives us always a lot to think about and a lot of viewers appreciate his, um, his, his, uh, his commentary. And I really hope, and I mean, this is what we, you and I to some degree really hope that, um, that Health Minister Adrian Dix and the Health Ministry are getting the message that something needs to be done right now. This can't go on. Well, and we're going to keep delivering the message in different ways in the weeks ahead, John. This is a theme that I think a lot of people feel very close to. We certainly do. There are so many people now that don't have access to a family doctor, and it's happening to more and more people because doctors keep retiring. And we'll continue to peel the onion on this important issue. But, John, we're reaching now the end of another Rumble Room. So in your usual colorful way, could you <laughs> tell our many viewers how they can like our show, subscribe, follow us, and support and be part of the Rumble Room from henceforth. Certainly I can. Well, this little engine that could, we now call the Victoria Rumble Room, has now reached, uh, well, we're 300,000 plus viewers. And the way that that's happening is through our Facebook page, which is really where we get the most rumbling. Uh, certainly on Twitter, uh, YouTube, Victoria Rumble Room with Robin and John, which is where all of our interviews are housed. In fact, the other day, uh, I had a whole bunch of likes and you could see that someone was moving through sequentially, well, the, the 70 or 80 uh, shows that we have on, the, on our YouTube site. We also have a Facebook, uh, sorry, and we also have a uh, website that really captures the podcast component of our vodcast. And of course, some of the most fun commentary is on Instagram and TikTok. And you can see where all of those addresses are. Please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. Well, Robin, oh boy, it wraps up another great show. I can't believe how many issues there are out there. I bid you adieu once again. Johnny Jurisic, the Croatian sensation. See you later. Absolutely. Sayonara. I'm Rockin' Robin Adair and rumble on! <laughs>